What is up, everybody? Josh Tapp here again, and welcome back to the Lucky Titan. Today, we're here with Dom Einhorn, and this interview is really, truly an honor for me. I mean, this guy has such an impressive career behind him, and honestly, I didn't know this, but he's lived very close to my hometown, so it's kind of cool to see those, those crossovers sometime. But uh, so Dom is the founder of the Startup Super Cup event, and this guy has helped thousands of entrepreneurs and startups to gain capital and to grow their businesses. And I'm really excited to have him here. So Dom, say what's up to everybody and then we'll hop in. Hey, Josh, thanks for having me. Glad to be on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate having you on, Dom. So let's dive into this first because you know, with all of your experience in building startups, you've been working with you know, thousands of different types of companies even. So you have a very unique perspective on this question. I wanna ask you this. So if you had lost everything and you only had 90 days to rebuild your business, what would you do? Like what type of business would you build and how would you build it and gain the funding so you could scale to profitability within 90 days? Uh, great question. Uh, number one, I've been in that situation twice and I've actually rebuilt it twice. I'm a risk taker by definition, like any entrepreneur is or should be. Uh, as an entrepreneur, your objective is to solve a problem not to invent one that you intend to solve, which is something we can talk about later that we see quite often as well. But I think the easiest way to explain what it is that I would do is I would actually question myself first and foremost. And then the very next thing that I would do is I would zero in on a problem, on a friction point that either consumers or businesses are encountering on a daily basis. I would come up with an answer to that problem quickly, efficiently, and as cheaply as I possibly can by iterating quickly. And I would pre-sell it prior to actually raising any money. Uh, what I mean by pre-selling it is I would take the actual concept itself and I would actually pitch that concept to uh, my intended target. And if you're, if, you're, if you're successful in doing that, it actually proves product market fit which very often is missing in more mature models. Uh, we do that internally where prior to launching a major new service, marketing service, for example, we actually build a deck. The deck will outline the friction point of the problem we're looking to solve. And then we'll pitch it to our existing client base and to some cold clients uh, or former clients. And we'll actually ask him to put down a deposit of 10% against future delivery of that product at a discounted rate. If you're able to do that, you know, number one, you're on the right track. And number two, once that product and service is ready, it will sell. I love that. And, and the, the beauty of that system is you're saying, let's, let's come at the market first, test to see what they want, and then we go and make it. We provide that service for them. And, and I would ask you this, especially coming from your, your experience with funding, at what point would you go get funding? Would it be after you've sold multiple customers on this or would you get product market fit pitch pitch investors and then start how would you how would you yeah I, th I think a big mistake that most entrepreneurs do is try to get funding too early what happens is obviously you dilute yourself uh, more so than further down the line that's probably logical and number two in most cases you're wasting your time because you're simply not ready to receive that funding so in my opinion, uh, you're, when is it time to raise funds? It's time when, 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 you, when you're actually ready to scale, which means that you have to have at least a bare bones proof of concept. Uh, it means that uh, you, you should have raised some money or tapped out friends and family, fools and family. Your grandmother should have invested, give you a hundred bucks at least, you know, and, tr and trust you. Uh, and then you got to be able to show a little bit of traction. Uh, you know, don't just come up with a blank slate, uh, even if you have a great business plan and whatnot, and you haven't put in points on the board because you have no credibility and you also have no authenticity to whom you're speaking to show that you have skin in the game and every investor can respect that. I love that. See, and that's the thing. I, I think that, I mean, we've even had people come to us to pitch us even at early stages saying, Hey, like, do you want to invest in this type of software that we're launching or what have you? And, and we found that the only ones that are, are worth the time are the ones who've said, they come to you and say, I've already had X amount of sales. We've proven concept. All they're really using your money for is to speed it up, to, to reach right. more people. So I, I love that. And I mean, that's coming from the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and, and this really leads well into how you've been investing your money, Dom. I mean, I really, 
it, the pre-conversation we had before this interview was was really insightful for me because you took you know, you've been working so heavily in the startup space but then in the last year you actually acquired you bought a rugby team so i, I want to know kind of what inspired that and then how you've been leveraging that to to scale their business as well yeah, it's very interesting. So I didn't grow up a rugby fan, even though I was following the French national team since a very early age. I liked uh, the toughness, the roughness of the sport. Uh, it's very authentic. It's literally guttural, right? I remember Jean-Pierre Yves, the French captain with, you know, you couldn't do this today, but blood dripping down his face and continuing to play, refusing to leave the pitch. That's still something that's very much ingrained in my mind, you know, 40 years later. Uh, you know, Interesting set of circumstances. My CPA, my French CPA, is a former French national player. Uh, he came to me early on when I first moved back to France in 2018 and said, Hey, would you like to support the rugby team? Yes, here is my token donation. You know, get a little tax write off, et cetera. Then last year, 2019, year and a half ago, uh, I became the largest sponsor because I befriended a lot of players, a lot of the staff, and I really started believing in the project. And then during the early innings of COVID, they came to me and said, look, we may not have a season at all, and we're in dire straits. We have a 118-year-old franchise, and it would be you know, a shame to lose it. Would you be willing to invest at a larger scale? And at that point in time, it became a business decision for me. And I said, look, give me a few days to think this over. I took a step back, and I came back with my conditions. I said, you know, this is no longer a passion type of investment. This is no longer a donation because you're asking for a significant amount of money. And now I have to make a decision as to whether or not to invest. If I do, here are my conditions. Number one, I want nobody in my space. I want to be the shot caller. You know, I need to have control. Uh, number two, I want to be able to do with this brand what needs to be done, which has never been done in the 118 year history of this club. And number three, I want to have car blanche to aggressively build out this franchise and go full pro and not stay in the semi-pro division. I'm not investing into status quo as an, as an investor. I never do that, regardless of which domain, right? I want to have impact. Uh, you know, in sports, you measure that by points on the board. In other places like clean tech, you measure that by impact on environment, impact on society, however you want to define it. So, you know, some of them reluctantly said yes. The majority were behind my project. We had a general assembly. The project was voted 45 over nothing, 45 to zero. And then boom, now we're in charge of a 118 year old startup, as I call it, right? Lots of skeletons in the closet. We started with a 25 yard penalty. Uh, we had to get rid of a lot of problems, a lot of people causing problems. And I think the parallels between seeing that in the nonprofit arena, because the club was run as an NGO uh, for the majority of its existence. And what we're seeing today in startup entrepreneurship, we're uncanny. Uh, a lot of people that claim to be entrepreneurs, but truly aren't, is one example. A lot of people that claim to be responsible, that they're irresponsible, especially when it comes to fiduciary uh, responsibilities. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Again, you know, a great startup first and foremost consists of a great team, great people. Uh, but for me, I looked at it as an opportunity because if everything had been rosy, I wouldn't have been able to buy in and take control over the club. And uh, so now it's up to me to turn, you know, lemons into lemonade. Uh, to, a large, to a large extent, that's what we have done. I'll give you one example. When we started the club at 1500 followers on Facebook, uh, four months later, I had 50,000 plus followers on Facebook. Uh, we have a full video production team, which didn't exist before. Completely redid the brand from A to Z. Uh, again, lots of similarities with startups that we're assisting. Because if you have a brand that doesn't resonate, the first thing you got to do is fix it rather than spending a million dollars on branding, right? I mean, it sounds stupid, but you know that's what you got to do. So a lot of checks and balances, uh, a lot of common sense. Uh, I think, you know, in hindsight, having spent a quarter century in the US and the other quarter century in, in France, I'd say there's a lot more common sense on the business side in the US than there is in France. Uh, there's plus and minus on each side. But uh, specifically, I say in the rugby space, because it's primarily driven by passion, almost religion. You, you know, whatever you think about religion, whenever there is something semi-religious that comes into play, usually emotions take the better of intellect 
and common sense. And that's what I'm facing every single day, but we have a full team behind us and we've made strides since we first took it over. Yeah, and it sounds like you've been able to take the program and, and you're not only changing the entire program, make, making the business side of it successful, but you're actually helping the players establish an entrepreneurial spirit so that they can actually go on after, that, after they're done with rugby and live very successful lives as entrepreneurs. And, and I'm, I'm genuinely curious about how you're actually doing that because you're almost taking people, and we see this a lot in the U.S., you know, the, the NBA players, NFL players, they're, you know, they're making what, $100 million contracts. And then five years after they retire, they're completely broke. And yeah. I'm just kind of curious how you're, you're implementing that in your, your program. Yeah, it's very interesting because obviously, again, a big parallel between uh, startup entrepreneurship and uh, athletes, you know, so the ability of taking a hit, falling down, being hurt, being injured and getting up and continuing to play right? This is probably one of the primary things you need in your DNA as a startup entrepreneur, right? Uh, I'm a former athlete myself, not in the rugby space, but in the fighting, in the fighting sports. Uh, so, you know, I, I had that in my DNA early on. It's not necessarily something you're born with, but it's something that you have to develop, you know, grit, resiliency, determination, persistence. So that attracted me very early on because I have, for example, one big Georgian prop, on my team. Uh, he's a forward, right? Big guy, huge guy. And if I don't hit him over the shoulder once a day, he thinks there's something wrong with me. At first I'm like, dude, I can't do this, right? Because, you know, I'm going to get arrested or, you know, if, if God forbid there is a, you know, a employment uh, inspection coming in and I'm actually hitting you over the head, you know, I'm going to get at least fined. Oh, no, 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 I don't think of it this way. So he comes in, I need to hit him over the head or live over the shoulder once a day. Otherwise he thinks I'm mad at him, right? But it's almost an extreme example, but it's pretty funny. So as of today, I've integrated eight professional players into my structure inside the incubator. And two things have happened. Number one, they've built amazing camaraderie amongst themselves that translates onto the field. These guys are like brothers because they spend all day together on and off the field. Number two, they've acquired a skill set that no one else acquires as a player, as a rugby player. So that got me to think about six, eight months ago, we launched a, what we call a rugby plus program. And initially when I mentioned it to the coaches, they told me, as they always say here in France, it's not gonna work, right? They said, well, how can you know if you don't give it a try? Let me just put it out there and see what happens. So now we have players from two or three leagues above us contacting us because of this rugby plus program, because it's something that they don't find you know, current top level pro players, top 14 contacting us once or twice a week. I read about your program. How can I be part of this? Right. And we're three leagues still beneath them. Right. So it has a lot of teeth and clearly it responds again, the parallel between entrepreneurship and sports. It re clearly resolves a problem in the marketplace by offering a tangible solution. That problem is the fact that you mentioned earlier that professional athletes, once they retire, they're just lost. It's almost like an inmate coming out of jail, right? And it's like, oh my God, what the hell? I spent 15 years in jail. What am I going to do now? I have no skill sets, et cetera, et cetera. It's very, very similar. And one guy mentioned that to me okay, right? because he had spent not 15 years, but even two weeks in jail, right? Because you come out there in the two weeks, it seemed like I was in there for six years. And I was like, what am I going to do in my life right now? I get the stigma forever, right? And I know nothing. So this helps us avoid that while at the same time tapping into an athlete who already has the core DNA of what we're looking for in an entrepreneur, which is, again, is grit, determination, resiliency, the ability to take a, a hit and get right back up. Yeah, I love that. And, and you'll actually watch with most entrepreneurs almost every single one of the successful ones has a sports background or they're currently in sports because like you said, there's so many parallels there and, and being able to get up again is, is the, the number one um, skill of an entrepreneur. I was talking to a guy the other day here on the podcast and he mentioned something that really stuck with me. He said, entrepreneurship has nothing to do with how fast you win. It's how long you're willing to stay in the game. And if you'll stay, you will win. 
And I, I thought that was so cool because that's been the story of my journey, right? It's been years before we were able to actually see any sort of real cash in our company. And then things took off, right? It's, it's the six year overnight success everybody talks about. Right? Yeah. And I mean, you've, you've been experiencing that and, and leveraging um, that experience with your, with your rugby players. So I love that. So I, I am kind of curious about this with those rug, rugby players, what have been some of the businesses that have intrigued them that they've decided to kind of build themselves? Yeah, the interesting thing at first is that they, none of them actually believe it's possible, right? So you actually have to kind of like reframe their minds and say, look, I picked you because I, not only do I believe it's possible, but because I know from my experience that you have what it takes to be successful here. So one guy, for example, who's Georgian from the country of Georgia, right? Speaks a little bit of English, a little bit of French. I said, I'm going to put you in sales. He goes, holy cow, what do you mean sales? All right? He goes, because you're this huge guy, you get this big beard, and you get this amazing smile, the Magic Johnson type of smile, and that works in sales. He goes, really, you think? I said, yeah, let's give it a try. Let's put it to the test. He outsells, outsells everybody today. Right. He just walks in with this huge smile, speaks broken French for the ones who don't speak French. He speaks English, broken English, et cetera. And he walks out with a deal. Right. What this has done to boost his morale, both both on and off the field. And he's actually become now a very super important element in my on, on my sales team. He because he counts for 40 percent of the local sales for the team. He did not think that was possible within two or three weeks, complete turnaround. And now the guy's like, holy cow. I can't believe this, right? I can actually do this. Uh, other things, you know, so we have a lot of international flavor on our team. I have two Argentinian players, one of which has become my team leader internally. Uh, kind of like, I don't want to call him a human resource director because it would be demeaning to him. He's my team captain, right? And he is kind of like the, always suffered in his career from being the small, small dog, big dog, because growing up, everybody told him he was too small to be a rugby player. Well, he made it all the way to the pros, right? So he kind of like built this resiliency, you know, and this grit. It's really, truly really part of his DNA and it translates onto others. He knows how to take someone who believes they cannot get it done and say, look, I've done it myself. If I can do it, you can do it. And it kind of like permeates the entire organization. So the easiest way to explain it is that, you know, by taking these key elements and adding them to the sauce, what it did in France, we say the, the mayo is starting to stick, right? It just provided significant glue. Uh, it pushed some people out because they thought it was not for them. It was too aggressive. Uh, it was too male, even though we have more females inside the organization than males, right? Which is fine because I think they would have left the organization or they didn't fit our DNA anyway. I think what, because of this, you know, flavor of political correctness that we all experiencing, you know, in, in recent years, I can tell you, I'm probably the most politically incorrect person that you'll ever meet or one of them. Uh, I'm going to be frank about that because when somebody tells me what it is that I should be doing, I'm going to do the opposite. I, I just don't like to be told what I should be told, especially by a politician or somebody who has never done it before. Right. So when they tell me, OK, you got to absorb a certain quota of white, black, green, yellow people, male, female, et cetera, I'm disengaged. What we have done is we've actually iterated where we say no matter how many smart people we have inside our organization, we know there are smarter people outside and we're going to leave ourselves open to whatever comes in because we're problem solvers. Right. So if you can help us solve these problems that we have internally or problems that we have identified for our client base, you're welcome. I don't care what color, creed, breed, whatever, right? Bring it in. And by way of working this way, we're today inside of the management team at Unicorn, roughly 30 people from 19 different countries, primarily female versus male, right? That's all I can say. So empirically, right, this is what happened. By taking the right approach, nobody had to tell us what we needed to do. Otherwise, it would look like any other company in Silicon Valley or some other parts of the world. Yeah, and I love that because I mean, really, it's it's not discrimination; it's discriminating based on talent and on on hundred percent grit, right? As you've been saying, that's been really the the topic and the theme of this episode is it's it's you're only going to allow the people who are are willing to to have that grit to get back up. They're the ones you're going to stick with and work with. So I love that. And for you guys, you know, you've you've been 
working with so many startups and seeing so much success in this space, and you've built an entire incubator around this, what, um, what, where did the event come from? I mean, you have an entire event based around helping people gain funding. So can you talk a little bit about that event? Yeah, I think the easiest way to describe the event is by comparing it to other platforms like Uber or Airbnb, right? So where you need to have a reasonable balance between supply and demand. So on Uber, if you only had drivers and no riders, you have a problem. If you only have riders, no drivers, you have a problem. Same with Airbnb, right? In the startup space, you need to have a good equilibrium between supply and demand between capital and people seeking for capital, right? And that's always the juggling act that we have to do. Uh, we decided to launch the Startup Super Cup for a number of reasons. First and foremost, we wanted to demonstrate to people that what we're doing here with inside a unicorn could be done in a non-metropolitan area, major metropolitan area outside, because we're in a rural space, 9,000 people in the winter, in Sala, S-A-R-L-A-T, for those of you who look it up, medieval town in the southwest of France, two and a half million tourists a year, seventh most visited town in France, highest density of medieval castles anywhere in the world, a thousand and two of them in a 25 mile radius, right? So it's primarily a destination for tourists, for gastronomy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my wife and I, a few years back said, look, we're not gonna leave Los Angeles to move to Paris, okay? We took eight months to scour France, 54 medium to small cities, made ourselves a private list. Sala was number one on both lists. So he said, okay, no point looking further. Uh, and we realized, obviously, we're going to miss a lot of things that we also had in Los Angeles. And we said, we're going to create them. In one example, when I first came here to visit in 2017, I stayed at a hotel, a very nice hotel, and I asked the hotel owner, uh, I need to do some work. Where can I find a co-working place? And he goes, what is that? I thought he was joking. Nobody was that serious. I'm like, explaining him the concept. I said, well, I, let me ask you a question. How do you do it when people like myself need to get some work done? And he goes, well, usually what we do is we unplug the printer from behind in the kitchen. We move it over here. We put three or four tables together. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. You do this every day? He goes, no, I do this three, four times a day. But I have news. <laughs> I have news for you. If you open up one of those working places, as he called it, I will send you 20 to 30 people a day. No, that's what we're doing. Part of the incubator, the extension of the incubator, we're moving into 30,000 square feet of space is going to be the largest uh, co-working space there is, you know, and the only one with two and a half million visitors every single year. So it's been very interesting in seeing that, you know, for example, when we first said, look, we're going to do the startup super cup, people asked why, how, where, et cetera, et cetera. I said, I don't even know yet, right? I just know this needs to be done and it needs to be done here because based upon my research, before COVID, 12% of startup entrepreneurs were looking for, you know, to launch their startup outside of a major metropolitan area. And during COVID, that number has gone out to 38% based on our research, right? We want to be able to offer them a plan B, and that plan B needs to exceed the value proposition of plan A. The event itself, the Startup Super Cup, will show them how it's done and will actually prove to them that not only startups are willing to relocate, but investment dollars are ready to flow, right? We've already demonstrated that in the run-up to the event, but ultimately this event will cement our region as a viable region from which to launch your startup and get it funded. I love that because it's you're pulling people from the ridiculously expensive areas everybody thinks you have to go to to start a business, the Silicon Valleys, New York, all these places, and you're, you're pulling 50, them. On, on just a rent side, 50 to 1 is the ratio between London, London rent and ours. That is insanity. And LA is probably significantly higher than that. <laughs> Actually, London is higher than LA, but not by really? that much. Yeah. So depending on where you are. If you go to East LA, you can probably find some cheap stuff, but you know, you risk your life every day too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I love that. Well, Don, that's really amazing. I am excited to see this event. So let me, let us know where we can get access to that event. Easiest way is to go to startupsupercup.com all in one string. Uh, we have a channel on YouTube as well, a couple of uh, reports uh, from French national TV, 
uh, I'll be on national TV again in a couple of weeks. I have to actually go physically to Paris, but it's worth it because it's the largest entrepreneurship show. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter. You'll see we have a who's who list of people, uh, probably the next president of South Africa. Uh, we have uh, Juliet Foster as a roundtable panelist. Uh, Juliet has uh, spent 20 years at the BBC as a presenter, uh, and she interviews all of the luminaries at Davos every year. And then uh, we will have over 800 angel investors from around the world. We have over 100 uh, financial and startup media, including some of the largest names uh, from the US, from Canada, from U UK, uh, of course, Europe as well. And uh, then we will have between 100 and 120 startups pitching for a grand prize, which is a large incubation package by Unicorn, as well as category specific prizes, uh, highly specialized in tech because we only do tech. So we're talking AI, AR, VR, FinTech, Agritech, because we're in a rural area, uh, educational technologies, et cetera. Also very large panel on DeFi, decentralized finance. That's awesome. See, and I love, love that. So make sure everybody go check out startupsupercup.com. Once again, that's startupsupercup.com, all in one string. So make sure you go check that out. Get your ticket. What an amazing event to attend. Um, especially if you're looking to, to get funding in that space or you're looking to fund companies in that space. So Dom, I want to ask you one final question before we sign off here. So my last question for you is what would be your final parting piece of guidance to an entrepreneur? I think we can probably come back to what we discussed earlier. It's the ability to get knocked down and get back up. But you guys have heard it many, many times in abstract terms. So I'm going to give you a life story. So that it resonates a little bit, uh, you know, it rings home a little bit more. Uh, I came up with my own rule and it's called the rule of 36 over one. When I first moved to the US in 1993, we were building websites and selling them to businesses in a time where it was like selling ice to Eskimos. People didn't know what the internet was. Many people called it a fad. And for the few that did know what it was said, I just don't need this, it doesn't make any sense. So. I needed to make 36 physical contacts on the phone with business owners to convince one to give me a shot and build them a website. Yet, a few years later, I sold that business for eight figures. So I turned what amounts to be 95 to 98% failure rate into an eight-figure business at the sale, right? I think a lot of us lose track when we're actually trying to do something. I think... Once you actually go through the process and you go through iteration, you actually have a proof of concept. One thing you need to realize very quickly is that nothing happens until you make a sale. Nothing happens until a sale is made. And what we're seeing today, very, very often, because it's so much cheaper today to launch a business, especially in the tech space, than it was 25 years ago. In March 1998, my bandwidth bill was $8,000 US, and I used 1,000 times less bandwidth than I'm using today. Today, it's free. Between 1999 and 2002, when we ran e-commerce websites, we needed what were called Oracle server licenses to run SQL. Per server instance, $32,000 today, free. Now that's the good news. The bad news is fast track 20 years later, anyone, any fool can launch a website, any, any fool can launch a business, start a business, but it's not necessarily a business that needs to exist, okay? What we're seeing very often every day are entrepreneurs that come to us with providing a problem instead of a solution. They're actually creating the problem that they intend to resolve. And that's just not durable. That's just not sustainable, right? In my experience, 5% of the people in this world have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. One out of 20. There's nothing wrong with the, with the other 95%. We need teachers. We need athletes. We need doctors. We need everybody right? But it doesn't mean that you're cut out to be an entrepreneur. So before you launch, ask yourself, am I willing to go the extra mile? You know, do, do I, am I willing to risk, risk anything, everything, lose everything in order to get to cross the finish line? If you doubt, then you're probably not the right person because the right entrepreneur has zero fear. He is a hustler. Or if you're not that person, surround yourself, make that person a part of your team because otherwise it's just not going to work.